Well, my teams have been uh, studying the structure of DNA and how to interpret it for a long time. And we're trying to extend that now into understanding how to extend uh, healthy human life. So when we first started reading the genetic code, uh, we call it digitizing life. It's converting the four-letter code into ones and zeros in the computer. And we did this first in 1995 with the very first genome. Uh, and there are fundamental questions of does DNA contain all the necessary information for life? So we decided to go the other way and start with the uh, ones and zeros and see if we could recapitulate life uh, by doing that. So uh, we used some of the information from the first genome, but we had to learn how to actually write the genetic code. Uh, we did this uh, first with a small virus uh, that infects E. coli. And uh, the virus uh, was about 5,000 base pairs long. We made it chemically. We injected it into E. coli, and uh, this was the actual, the first experiment of what happened. Uh, e. coli read this synthetic piece of DNA, like normal DNA, started making proteins. The protein self-assembled and made the virus, uh, and the virus killed the cells. So we call this a situation where the software builds its own hardware. We wrote a piece of chemical code put it in a bacteria, and it made a virus. So our goal wasn't to make a virus, it was to make an entire cell, uh, one base pair at a time. Uh, this took much longer than we thought it would, uh, but over that time, uh, we developed a wide range of technologies that enabled us to actually write the genetic code uh, very effectively. So the chemistry was one side, the biology was another. And we had to develop a way to boot up now this total synthetic chromosome that we had made. And fundamentally, uh, we have a cell where we inject the uh, DNA into the cell. And so this cell now has two sets of genetic instructions. Uh, as soon as the new DNA started being read, it made enzymes that chewed up the original DNA in the cell, uh, giving us an entire new cell. So we ended up uh, with these cells that not a single previous molecule in the cells uh, had existed. They all originated from the piece of synthetic DNA. Now this was sort of the control experiment in 2010. We spent the next five years designing a new cell in the computer made the DNA and booted it up. Uh, the biggest surprise is about a third of the genes were unknown to science, showing that we're very early still in our understanding of genomes. Uh, but one thing it did show us is that DNA sequence was interconvertible with the digital world. So we could take a piece of DNA, sequence it, digitize it, and then we could take that digital information and convert it back to DNA. So we made a machine that actually does this. It's called uh, a biological teleporter or a digital uh, biological converter. And we can actually send the information through the internet. Uh, we can send it through radio waves uh, to Mars, et cetera. And we tested this early on uh, with the flu outbreak. So we have an epidemic going on right now with flu because the vaccine that was given doesn't match the flu strain that's actually infecting people because they make these decisions almost a year in advance. We sequence a strain breakout, H11N9, in China. The, the Chinese group sequenced, posted to the internet. Uh, we made that sequence in a week. Uh, and got it into a lab in Novartis to scale up very quickly, making a new vaccine 
uh, against that viral strain. So instead of taking years to do this, uh, the U.S. government, in fact, decided to use this for emergency flu outbreaks and stockpiled a large amount of the virus. But uh, nothing's really happening with changing how we approach flu vaccines. So instead of having one center uh, to do this, uh, Dubai, for example, had its own center, we can send the information for a new vaccine around the world in a fraction of a second. It could be made locally and distributed. So technology exists, we're just not using it. Now, flu is not the biggest killer of people on the planet at the moment. Uh, if you live to the age of 50, about a third of you won't live to the age of 74. As you can see, it's uh, slightly worse for men. About 40% of men won't make the age of 74. And uh, about 24% of women won't live to be the age of 74. The two biggest reasons are heart disease and cancer. So when we were thinking of setting up uh, how to change human longevity, we decided we had to tackle all diseases, but first and foremost, predicting cancer, predicting uh, heart disease. Medicine today is if you have symptoms, you go get those symptoms checked out to find out if you have a disease. Uh, sometimes that can be late stage cancer. We're dealing with four women in their early 30s that have stage four colon cancer. Uh, that's somewhat confusing because in the US, you're not supposed to get screened for colon cancer till you're 50 years old. Uh, so we're taking new techniques for early detection uh, we've set up a new whole body assessment that combines the genome with multiple mo modality uh, testing. And we only screen uh, people who think they're healthy. We combine all this data with machine learning uh, to make new discoveries about disease and how to treat it and how to prevent it. In part, we have uh, exciting new technologies. Uh, using the latest MRI machines from Siemens or GE, we have algorithms that can do post-processing on that data and cause a tumor cell to light up uh, very brightly. This is just based on the water differences uh, in tumor cells versus regular cells. Uh, so we use no contrast in the MRI. Uh, about 5% of people who get MRI contrast have a bad allergic reaction to it. And also, people used to use uh, just CT scans. CT scans are x-rays. They can't tell the difference between a cyst and a tumor. So here's an example. Uh, of a physician, one of our first uh, clients to come in, who had no symptoms, uh, but we found this five centimeter tumor underneath his breastbone. Uh, within a week, it was removed. Uh, had he not had it removed, it would have metastasized uh, in the next six months or so, and he would have less than five years to live. As it is, he's cancer-free, the tumor is gone, it was stage one, uh, but you can see the bright light uh, shown with our post-processing, that's algorithmic processing, uh, that works extremely effectively. One of the areas uh, that has had a huge impact is in prostate cancer. I'm sure the men here know there's two kinds of prostate cancer. There's the kind you die with, and the kind you die from. High-grade prostate cancer is the kind that you die from. And so the MRI readily picks up high-grade prostate cancer. You can see the bright orange, reddish-orange areas. That's where the post-processing algorithm uh, says there's a uh, tumor. Uh, so we've diagnosed these in about 3% of men uh, over the age of 50. 
they get surgery or radiation, uh, and every one of them now is 100% uh, cancer-free. If those metastasize, the five-year survival rate is 28%. Uh, here's another example. You can see these tumors lighting up very brightly. Uh, these are lymphomas, uh, and they were simply treated uh, with chemotherapy and radiation. We detected them before they became metastatic cancer. None of these individuals had the slightest hint that they had cancers. In the U.S., one and a half million people get diagnosed with cancer each year. They just didn't get cancer the day before they were diagnosed. We carry cancer sometimes for months, sometimes uh, for years, before they grow big enough uh, to cause, cancer, cause problems. So we're finding this uh, in about 5% of people over 50 that think they're completely healthy. So think of your health system uh, that but basically all the healthy people in this room, 5% uh, of you have a major tumor that you're not aware of. And you'll only find it when it metastasizes or gets big enough to cause problems. From the MRI, we get metabolic data as well. Uh, we can tell how much fat is in your liver uh, and liver and organ fat is one of the most important predictors uh, of your longevity and disease. Uh, you can see we can integrate this across the entire liver. Uh, we can integrate it across all the organs. We're finding elevated fatty liver in about 23% of the population across all age groups. Uh, we don't know yet what percent of these turn into fibrosis. Uh, and require uh, liver transplants, uh, but it's going to be a significant number. There are sets of algorithms that allow us uh, to detect quantitatively the amount of peripheral versus visceral fat, the exact amount of muscle that you have, uh, so we can give you a very clear picture of your health status at a metabolic level. We can tell whether you have pre-pre-diabetes uh, using chemicals in the bloodstream that we sequence with mass spec. I mentioned that we do uh, contrast-free MRI. Even so, we can get these incredibly gorgeous pictures of your vascular system uh, without contrast, just using the algorithm uh, to tell the difference between water molecules. Uh, this becomes very useful because in 1% of people, we're finding brain aneurysms. Brain aneurysms are usually discovered when they start bleeding badly, you get bad headaches. Uh, usually it goes on to people dying uh, from these. Uh, here's another one that had to be operated on right away because it was uh, uh, close to a centimeter in size and the neurosurgeons thought that it was likely to burst at any moment. These are now treated as an outpatient, just putting a coil up through uh, your blood vessels. Uh, these can be treated and you go home the same day, which is very different than having a high risk of death. 1% uh, of the population, despite age, has a brain aneurysm. So, you can calculate at least uh, four or five of you here uh, have a brain aneurysm that you don't know about. The MRI is advancing very rapidly. Uh, in 15 minutes in the MRI, we can get a complete cardiac evaluation, uh, and the computer prints out the report uh, before you even finish. In another year or so, the MRI will be able to see inside your coronary vessels and tell you the exact status of your heart with heart disease. We also do 4D echo uh, that gives us uh, these pictures of the four uh, vessels of the heart. Uh, we can actually look right down your different heart valves and look at them. And with Doppler shifts, we can tell if there's any regurgitation. 
and they get the exact status. We also do cardiac CT scanning, which measures the amount of calcium in your blood vessels. Uh, and this is something where uh, this is showing up in earlier and earlier populations and more and more in a female population. So right now we're seeing uh, calcium plaques in about 12% of people. Half of these are under the age of 60. Uh, we have one woman in her 40s that all four coronary arteries uh, were blocked. She has no history of heart disease. She's not obese, um, but uh, she's now uh, being treated uh, having this knowledge. We use remote sensing devices. So uh, by wearing a simple patch that records your EKG for two weeks, we can find out whether you have uh, episodic atrial fibrillation. Uh, I'm sure most of you know that's one of the major causes of strokes. And it turns out multiple people have episodic AFib. Here's three that had it uh, for eight hours a day, probably while they were sleeping and they had no awareness of it. So simply putting them on anticoagulants uh, saves their lives. We do a comprehensive analysis of your brain and we can predict whether you're not, whether you have Alzheimer's disease and when you're likely to get it. So we can combine the brain imaging with the genome data in a novel fashion, uh, but it's not clear cut. Here's an individual with two copies of the APOE uh, gene that puts them at very high risk for Alzheimer's disease, uh, but his hippocampus is large, totally normal, and there's no hint whatsoever for disease. Uh, so what we see, uh, we see an increased risk in about 24%. Uh, the genome predictions, uh, about 82% of those are right. But we have new algorithms, and this is just an example of what we're doing with all diseases, that combines the genetic data with all the unique imaging from different parts of the brain to predict when and if you will get Alzheimer's disease. So we can predict your risk, uh, down to the month when you're likely to see symptoms. We do all kinds of other predictions on your height, your weight, your BMI, your eye color, your hair color, uh, and we wanted to go further. We wanted to see if we could predict from your genetic code uh, your picture. So using machine learning, uh, we did a study on 1,000 people where we took 3D pictures of them uh, and sequence their genomes. And here's just a couple of examples. Uh, this is the, uh, a, a smooth uh, a subject uh, from the photograph, and here's the uh, prediction straight from the ACs, Gs, and Ts of the genetic code. Here's another example of a young male. Here's the computer prediction from his genetic code. Uh, the more ethnic diversity, the better. Here's a young African, uh, and here's this computer prediction straight from the genetic code. We show these just because we have this health intelligence cycle where we're combining new discoveries in the genome from having hundreds of thousands of genomes, so we get very accurate data with actual clinical phenotype data that says whether you have cancer or not, says whether you have Alzheimer's or not. Uh, and this is a whole new preventative medicine paradigm that turns medicine on its head uh, and will save countries uh, billions, if not trillions of dollars if they adopt these approaches. Thank you very much.